Good morning, everyone, and welcome to the FITC Advisory Quarterly Industry Roundtable. My name is Jay Onosoya. I'm the Associate Director and Head of Advisory for FITC. You are all welcome, and we sincerely apologize for starting late. So we are starting right away. I'll just give you a brief on the advisory roundtable before we go into the program for today. The advisory roundtable is a quarterly program where we bring thought leaders to this platform to discuss topical issues that are of macroeconomic and national importance, issues that affect the different sectors within the financial services industry across banking, across insurance, capital markets, as well as pension. And for us at FITC, we are known for bringing world-class and global leaders who would come to share significant experience with us. And the topic for us today is on factoring. And we already have subject matter experts who will share insights with us and we'll get to learn new things about the topic of factoring, which is an emerging industry in Nigeria. This, um, the theme of this um, round table is factoring a game changer for the growth of MSMEs and the Nigerian financial services industry. And it is very pertinent to us because we are all here. We want growth for our economy as well as Africa as a whole. And factoring has been a catalyst for growth in other countries. So uh, the subject matter experts we have assembled today will share global experience with us, country experiences as well, what other countries have done well and what we need to do in Nigeria to get this industry started. At this time, I'll be calling on the MD CEO of FITC, Mrs. Chizo Malize, to give us the opening address. You are all welcome once again. Thank you. Okay, I'll be giving the opening address on behalf of the MD CEO of FITC, um, who is not here at the moment, and she sends her regards. Um, good morning, distinguished ladies and gentlemen. I'm pleased to welcome you all to the Advisory Quarterly Industry Roundtable. FITC is an innovation-led and technology-driven and dynamic organization. And we have always organized thought leadership events, summits, board and executive programs on contemporary issues with the goal of providing actionable insights to relevant stakeholders within and outside the Nigerian financial services sector, as well as Africa as a whole. Deliberations from these events have helped in strengthening policies and regulations for the Nigerian financial services sector. The FITC Quarterly Advisory Roundtable is FITC leading market discussion and consultation forum. And for us on a quarterly basis, we gather thought leaders from the financial service sector, as well as the real sector, government agencies, regulators, venture capitalists, private equity firms, and the international community to discuss, to share experiences, gain insight, as well as foster solutions to pressing industry and macroeconomic issues. This event is designed as a platform to also attract local and international renowned financial service thought leaders, as well as industry players to discuss the regulation and opportunities in the factoring industry, as well as engage regulators and also strengthen the capacities, the capacity of the um, micro and small medium enterprises to assess the needed liquidity to scale up their operations, while also endangering trust and confidence in the market. Factoring, which is the topic in focus, and that's why the theme of today is on factoring a game changer for the growth of MSMEs and the Nigerian service industry. 
Factoring is a structured trade finance instrument that provides funding for the purchase and sale of receivables. It ensures that business owners, both micro, small, and medium enterprises, they have the required liquidity to run their operations, and this in turn drives growth. This industry has a great potential to contribute up to 5 to 20 percent to the Nigerian GDP. The size of the global factory market is estimated as $640 billion and is projected to reach $860 billion by 2020. It really has great potential. And this is the time for Nigeria to also tap into this industry to leverage for growth. While factoring is gaining momentum in other countries as an alternative source of financing for the MSMEs, it is still at infancy in Nigeria. While Nigeria is making progress towards establishing a structured industry, Nigeria currently, the bill for the factoring industries being considered at the National Assembly. And the bill is aimed at promoting integration of Nigeria into the global factory market to enhance non-oil export trade, particularly within the African continental free trade area, thus helping to support the diversification of the objectives of the federal government of Nigeria. So the factoring industry is also another way of diversifying the Nigerian economy from the oil sector. I want to use this opportunity to commend the Central Bank of Nigeria, the Nigerian Factoring Working Group, the German Agency for International Cooperation, that's GIZZ, the Nigerian Export Import Bank, that's NEXIM, the African Export Import Bank, that's Afrexin, and other stakeholders who have shown commitment towards advocating and supporting the establishment of a regulatory framework for factoring in Nigeria. A key element of this framework is the advocacy and the establishment of capacity building initiative for the sector. And this for us at FITC is what we are committed to do to ensure that this industry gets to where it ought to be in attaining the objective of catalyzing growth for the Nigerian sector. And we at FITC will continue to work collaboratively with all stakeholders to support the growth of the industry. This roundtable promises to be inspiring and enriching session as we engage to have robust conversation on how we can grow the industry for the benefit of our entrepreneurs, the Nigerian financial service industry players, which includes the banks, insurance companies, as well as the overall Nigerian economy. I once again welcome you to this session and we look forward to having robust conversation on the topic of factoring today. Thank you.
At this time, I'll be calling on Mr. Ibrahim Hassan, the Acting Director of Financial System Strategy, FSS 2020 for the Central Bank of Nigeria to give his opening address. We welcome you, Mr. Hassan. Hello, Mr. Hassan, you need to unmute your mic. Okay, while we are waiting for um, Mr. Hassan, we'll call um, the lead speaker for this session, that's Mr. Peter Mulroy, who is the Secretary General for Factors Chain International Netherlands. He will be taking us on the presentation on growth of the factoring industry. He'll be giving global perspective, legal and regulatory frameworks and opportunities for the Nigerian financial service players, as well as some lessons to share with us as Nigeria. So we'll be calling on Mr. Putomora to take his presentation. Okay, I'm just coming on now, thank you. Um, it's a pleasure, thank you so much. See, um, I, I just wanna ask you, I have a, a small, a short presentation I thought maybe I could give, um, I could just share the screen if that's okay. Yes, that's fine. Okay. I'm just gonna start here at the main, uh, the main, the first page. Um, yeah, I thought maybe I could talk a little bit about um, what's happening in the world of factoring. Um, give a little bit overview of, of uh, a little bit about FCI um, and then talk a little bit about what's happening uh, around the world and then specifically in Africa. Um, so, okay, let me just start and just say, you know, my name is Peter Mulroy, and I, I thank you for attending this event. I thank the uh, FITC for organizing the event. Um, FCI um, uh, is a global association. We're a nonprofit association headquartered in Amsterdam in the Netherlands, where I'm, where I'm dialing in now. Um, we provide a number of different services for the receivables, finance, and factoring industry. But these are some of the what I call the six pillars of our organization, um, where we help companies do international factoring. We help companies, factoring companies, so banks, non-banks, uh, pr provide legal services, education, 
promotion, compliance, and and influence like this uh, event that we're organizing today. Um, uh, we start with the concept of receivable as an investable asset class. And I always like to start with this slide because of course, historically, countries around the world are accustomed to financing things that you can touch and feel, hard assets like real estate, like equipment, like buildings, um, um, automobiles. But this concept of, of financing paper, um, you know, financial assets, we're somewhat accustomed to like stocks, bonds, derivatives, cash accounts, et cetera. But uh, quasi intangible assets like uh, receivables are something new and especially new in the, um, in the uh, um, in emerging markets. But receivables are liquid assets. And in most balance sheets of small to medium sized enterprises, especially these assets lie dormant on the balance sheet of most companies. And they exist because they, the company sold a product or service to a buyer or buyers. And as a result, uh, on terms, on open account terms, on credit terms, and as a result, an, a, a receivables created. And these receivables don't have any value until the buyer pays uh, in the future. And the whole concept of factoring and, and receivable finance is to unlock unlock the value of these very important liquid assets uh, that lie on the on the balance sheet. And you know we start we start with the, what is the receivable and, and the receivable is an asset like any other asset that has rights and risks. The rights of the of the of the receivable, the rights of the owner of the receivable or what we call the creditor is that the ability to enforce collection against the buyer, against the debtor, the the right to modify the right to assign the receivable to a third party like a factor or pledge. And the risks, of course, the risks, uh, the credit risk of the inability to pay, uh, the, so the buyer filing bankruptcy, defaulting on payment to the seller. Uh, there could be uh, other risks like uh, what we call contract risk, defenses or disputes and set off. And, um, and there, the, other, the main risks that we look at uh, from a factoring perspective are Three, performance risk, where the seller can't perform. And that's the biggest risk to the factor because if they can't produce the product and they've, they've funded it, um, then the buyer will not pay. They, the buyer has a right under a receivable to dispute that receivable. They have the right. And so that when the buyer, uh, excuse me, when the cl client or the, f uh, the producer of the product or, or, or service sells the receivable, they're also selling that risk of disputes to the factor. So the factor has to, per to manage that risk very carefully. There's the, the other risk, of course, is the payment, the non-payment due to bankruptcy and default, which I talked about. And the last, and maybe the biggest risk is fraud. Uh, the uh, fraudulent uh, activity of a, a client seller or a client seller and the customer buyer, what we call collusion risk. Uh, and this is something that has to be monitored and, and, and be looked at. I, I just wanted to start out with a very simple introduction you know, to uh, the risks uh, of factoring. Uh, but of course, at the end of the day, it's the assignment of the receivable to a factor and a factor providing liquidity. I wanna talk now about the, the global industry and you can see the global industry is huge. Uh, the industry has is is now over three point, nearly three point one trillion euros, and we denominate it in euros because Europe is the largest market in the world, as you can see in the top here. Um, it has a market of almost two point over two point one trillion euros. It accounts for sixty nine percent of the global industry, but that's from Russia to France, Sweden to Malta. It grew last year at nearly fifteen percent. And I have to say, I've been tracking these growth rates uh, for the last 20 years. These re rates you'll never see again, 15% uh, in Europe, uh, North America, 46%, um, Africa, 28%, Asia Pacific, 7%. So phenomenal growth. Um, and this comes off the heels of a very difficult year in 2020, where we saw a reduction in factored volume uh, of nearly 200 billion euros or about six and a half percent. So we have already, we've more than made up for this drop. 
uh, and we doubled it. So instead of six and a half, we have now 13 and a half percent growth rate. Phenomenal, phenomenal growth, phenomenal year for factoring. Um, the global factoring six, as you can see, are, has been growing on a compounded annual growth rate of 8%. Every year, 8% for the last 20 years, from a little over 500 billion to today over 3 trillion. Um, and the biggest drivers of that growth has been in Europe, uh, international, the dark red, uh, and Asia. Now you could see here, uh, the, the world of factoring is divided uh, globally, but of course the lion's share is in Asia, 68%. The second largest region being uh, to being Asia, and the, the third largest region being the Americas, six percent. Uh, Africa is one percent of global volume, and the Middle East only zero point three percent. I'm just going to fly through these slides, but this just gives you an idea by region. Uh, uh, France is the largest market in Europe, uh, followed by Germany and the UK. It's been growing incredibly in the last uh, three years. But UK was affected by Brexit, and that's why you see the five-year compounded growth rate very small, really flat. Um, but uh, 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 we can just jump here. Uh, I'm gonna, I can't spend time here, but this slide is interesting because this is the GDP uh, for the European Union. You could see the dark blue line uh, for, for, um, um, uh, for, for, yes, for the EU. And then the top line is the countries in the EU factoring performance. And again, you could see in the EU, the growth was 11% versus a GDP growth of 5.5%. Um, and this is after a, a huge drop uh, in, in, in volume and in, and in GDP in 2020. Um, this is Asia. And you can see China is the, the biggest market in the world. Um, it's been growing at a, a, a very strong clip over 13% over a year for the last five years, 8% last year. Uh, and you can see followed by Japan, Taiwan, Australia, Hong Kong. Uh, and then we jump to, um, uh, uh, we jump to, excuse me, we jump to um, international cross border. This is just based on FCI statistics, but you can see here 2019 trade war minus 19%, 2020 COVID minus 32%. But then we had a jump uh, in 2020, a recovery like we had in domestic of uh, 15% growth. And 2022, uh, I anticipate that we'll have another almost possibly double digit growth uh, as well. So <laughs> very, very interesting. Uh, um, as of as of the really the first half of this year, we should have a growth of 30 percent in international. Phenomenal. Now, this is the two areas that I spoke about late payments, past dues and dilution. We'll start with dilution on the right. You could see dilution risk increased from 4.8% uh, to 6.2% during the COVID crisis, but now has dropped to unbelievable levels, levels I've never seen before. 2.8% dilution is unbelievable, honestly, folks. Um, but it's, it, to me, it's, it, it, the, I, 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 I believe the reason is due to the massive amounts of liquidity and the massive amounts of, of stimulus from the governments uh, in 2020 and 2021 and what does money do? It, it obviously helps with supply chain. It helps move goods and services. It helps uh, with the entire, uh, what I call the oil of the industry. And then late payments. Late payments also skyrocketed during the, during the COVID crisis, but it's come down extremely well. And again, same reason, a massive amount of liquidity in the market. Um, these are just the different types of products in factoring. And you could see non-recourse factoring is the largest part of factoring. What this means is that you can't, when you finance the, the seller, you can't go back to the seller. You have no recourse back to the seller. Uh, your recourse is to the buyer. So you're looking for your source of repayment, not from the seller, but from the buyer. And that is the largest portion here. Uh, uh, and it's growing. It's growing significantly year over year. This is the percentage of, of, <coughs> of domestic and international of the total 3.1 trillion euros uh, in volume, 81% is domestic and 19% international. And this just shows a comparison of, um, of pro the product and factoring compared to credit insurance, LCs, and world exports. And you could see um, LCs have been you know, declining uh, over the last um, uh, years. We compare that to um, uh, cross-border factoring has been growing about three, three close to three and a half percent Global factoring, domestic, international, 
in this period has only been growing, and this is in US dollars. So please understand the difference. The size of the industry is 3.5 trillion, huge, but in US dollar terms, but it's only been growing, it's been growing slower in US dollar terms. And that's because of the strength of the Euro. Um, the Euro has suffered a little bit this last year, I might add. Credit insurance, six and a half percent, growing very strongly at 2.9 trillion. And world exports, about 2.3 trillion. 22.5 trillion total. Okay, and this is just a picture of that same screen. You could see um, uh, LC's at the bottom, 2.7 trillion, open account receivables finance, uh, and then the, the uh, total world, uh, open account merchandise trade in the blue. I just wanna add here, uh, sorry for the misprint up on the top, but I looked at what happens during crises. We're in a crisis now. We've been in the crisis for the last two years, this pandemic. And the two biggest other crises were the Great Depression and the Great Recession. And you can see in the Great Depression, which is, factoring was practiced as significantly during that, those days and grew phenomenally at a compounded growth rate of 13% from 1935 to 1948. Fast forward to the Great Recession in 2008, 2009, massive, uh, uh, massive problems, a uh, decline in volume of minus 3%, but we saw a huge growth from 1.3 trillion to nearly 3 trillion, uh, growing at a 9% compounded growth rate. And so this crisis today, I view in the same light. I think that if you combine factoring, reverse factoring, uh, and other, other types of receivable products, we're about 5 trillion, a little over 5 trillion. We think that will grow to 10, uh, 10 trillion by 2030, uh, which would be about a 6% growth rate and equate to about 10% of global GDP. So. Trust me, factoring is the growth uh, product for the future. Um, I'm gonna skip this for now and I'm just gonna drop jump to Africa. And you could see we have 41 members in Africa today. Uh, FCI has 400 members. So it's about 10% of the membership. You can see they're all over Africa. 10 years ago, we had 10 members. So we've, we've quadrupled this number um, and we continue to grow rapidly. Um, the volume in Africa, uh, you could see here, uh, has grown really nicely, um, 3% uh, uh, on average. Now, I will say this, the South Africa figures, this is an old slide, it actually grew 8, 28%. We just got these figures just, just a week or so ago, and I failed to update it, but it was a 28% growth rate in South Africa. Um, and you can see here, Morocco, 0% uh, growth, Egypt, 3%. Uh, Tunisia had a drop last year, Mauritius, 12%. Um, we have an active education program in Africa. You could see all the students, and I think it was over uh, just in 2020, for example, we had probably th over 300 students total taking various courses within the FCI Academy um, or attending, uh, attending workshops. Um, and it's great. I mean, we're, this is how we educate the industry and everybody on this call is eligible to take uh, various introductory courses on factoring. And all you need to do is contact FCI or the Afrax and Bank. I'm gonna skip this slide only because it's, uh, it's long and I, just for the sake of time, but we have a lot of projects uh, in the works uh, to help evolve factoring from a from a legal and regulatory perspective. And as you know, in Nigeria, we have been working for the last seven, eight years together with the Afrex and Bank and the Nigerian Export Import Bank on the development of a factoring law and on the development of regulations in, in Nigeria to allow for factoring to prosper and grow and to provide confidence to those investors in small to medium sized enterprises. We've done various workshops, uh, various promotion campaigns, capacity building, et cetera, et cetera, all throughout Africa in the last three years. It's been incredible. And I have to say, this is predominantly due to the leadership of the uh, uh, African Export Import Bank, uh, thanks to people like Eric, who's gonna hear, who you'll hear from in a minute, and uh, Dr. Uh, Benedict Orama, who's the president and CEO a uh, Nigerian from, from the Afro Exim Bank and also Kanayo Awani, the, she's the chairman of the Africa FCI chapter and she's the managing director of Inter-Africa uh, Trade for, for, uh, for the Afro Exim Bank. Um, and together with the Nigerian Export Bank, our member in Nigeria uh, and uh, our members as well, for example, uh, uh, Factoring and Supply Chain Finance uh, in Lagos, uh, who's, who's here on this call today as well, 
you know, this is a this this evolution is not something that FCI leads by itself. It's done jointly with our members, with leaders like uh, Afroexim Bank, with leaders like uh, um, uh, uh, Nexim, and also, of course, thanks to FIT, FITC uh, and and many many other partners that I'm I'm failing to mention. Um, okay, so uh, I think that's it. I, I just because of the sake of time, I, I don't want to. Uh, I don't want to uh, take all the time on this panel, so I'll stop here. And maybe if you guys have questions, I can stay on. So thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter, for that short but very impactful presentation. You've given us some historical perspective to factoring, and it's interesting to see how it's an instrument to be used during crisis. I mean, we've seen example from the great um, recession as well. And it's also instructive to note the different risks that um, the, both the buyers and the sellers of factoring also face in the course of facilitating um, financing for trade receivables. Thank we'll you be, very much. Thank you so much. So we still wanted to just stick around because we'll be going into the panel session and I'm sure we'll have questions for you to answer for us. Absolutely. All right, thank you. Um, we'll be calling on Mr. Hassan now, the um, acting director of the Financial System Stability for the Central Bank of Nigeria, who'll be giving us the opening address. Welcome, Mr. Hassan. Thank you very much, Shay. Thank you very much. Welcome, everyone. Uh, Peter, thank you so much for a wonderful uh, presentation, which uh, actually put uh, context and perspective to what we're discussing today. So stand on existing protocols, as we say here, I welcome you once again to this important event and program on factoring. It is quite uh, satisfying to know that the momentum towards improving access to finance for Nigerian SMEs is up and running very well indeed. At the Financial System Strategy 2020, the, where I currently work, we believe a robust financial system is a premise for creating opportunities for businesses to thrive. Our perspective is that without actually empowering the MSMEs, we will not be able to meet the aspirations we have for the financial system as the Nigerian economy as a whole. Our strategic objective at the FSS are among others, more importantly, to deepen the domestic financial markets, integrate the international financial markets, and also to promote sustainable economic development. The FSS 2020 strategy and its objectives are anchored on this in order to create an environment that will ensure the financial system is robust enough to support sustainable economic development. And that is where MSMEs and factoring become critical. Also at the FSS 2020 and the strategy we're implementing, recognize the gaps concerning access to finance for MSMEs. With an $8.9 trillion, trillion with a T, financing gap, for developing countries, according to the, the diagnostic report in 2022. And also the indication by the SME Forum that Nigeria has an MSME financial gap of 158 billion US dollars. This is quite huge and significant and definitely new innovative ideas need to be brought into perspective. And sadly, as much as the Central Bank of Nigeria has come up with programs, initiatives for interventions to promote access to low-cost financing for MSMEs, though helpful, has barely scratched the surface. A lot needs to be done. However, we're also optimistic that with a size of uh, 131 million MSMEs in developing countries and about 48 million in South Saharan Africa, according to the MSME Forum survey in 2022, Nigeria contributes about 39 million MSMEs, according to the Smeden Nigeria Bureau for Statistics survey in 2021. This accounts for 30% among developing countries and 80% of the SSA figure, so Saharan Africa. So Nigerian MSMEs actually constitute 80% of the total MSME population in South Saharan Africa. And that is quite huge. 
being that as it may, for us, this explores the potential available for the adoption of factoring as an alternative means of finance and enhancing the effectiveness and the success rates of the MSMEs in Nigeria. And of course, factoring, when we're talking about it, has to be just because with inverse financing market landscape, as it is currently looking at its size. And even though Nigeria is not rated among the active participants in factoring, several reasons have been adduced to this, including the absence of regulations, complexity of the structure of the financial system, the risk uh, issues, etc., etc. Let me set for the records that the FSS 2020 strategy has been collaborating with key stakeholders in this area to view the financing gaps for MSMEs through various initiatives like the extension of the National Collateral Registry, the implementation of business continuity credit model, et cetera, et cetera. And at this point, I must appreciate and mention the great work, collaborative effort between us and the Central Bank of Nigeria Nexin, Afri Nexin, GIZ Sedan, FITC, the Nigerian Factual Working Group, amongst many others. We really appreciate your efforts and we look forward to continuous collaboration until we get the scale of attraction required to change the lending financing landscape for MSMEs in Nigeria. We are equally actively involved with other stakeholders in deepening and promoting the development of factory in Nigeria, like I mentioned. And this could be portrayed from the fact that between 2015 to date, we have led, coordinated, collaborated in pushing regulations and bills at the National Assembly to actively promote the empirical diagnosis of the factual ecosystem in Nigeria. Uh, you are all aware and you participated in the development review of the diagnosis report uh, generously commissioned by GIZ and Nexin to understand actually what is happening in the factory landscape in Nigeria. What are the issues? What kind of initiatives need to be implemented to address those issues? This empirical diagnostic for the factory ecosystem in Nigeria anchored on the factory working group, Nigeria factory working group, and the diagnosis study as I mentioned in Nigeria, also involved the CBN technical committee on the draft of factory guidelines. So it is important to note at this point that there are several efforts taking place simultaneously to promote this effort. At the Central Bank of Nigeria, there is a high powered committee that was instituted by the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria himself to come up with guidelines that will promote factoring in Nigeria and also address the key challenges while at the same time we are pursuing the legislative option of having a factoring bill becoming law in Nigeria. In terms of sensitization, and of, of course, uh, Peter also mentioned this in his uh, address, in his presentation, we'll continue to use the FSS 2020 platform, considering its large span of operations within the whole Nigerian financial system, covering the financial markets, commodities, money market, foreign exchange market, the MSME space, pensions, insurance, mortgages, the whole gamma, the whole Nigerian financial system. We believe this is a veritable platform that could provide that avenue, achieve that traction required. Because factor, as you all know, goes across the different sectors of the financial system. As well as the support of governments, in which case a lot of advocacy efforts are going into this, to ensure that key stakeholders understand what the issues are, what are the potential benefits of having a successful factoring landscape in Nigeria. We're also working with our human capital development enabler within the FSS 2020 to organize workshops for key stakeholders at this level of sensitization advocacy, understanding what the issues are, what the potentials are, and how it could be a game changer. And Particularly, I wish to appreciate, recognize the efforts of the FITC towards that uh, goal, which of course culminated in this as part of a series of sensitization events. We believe this kind of events will help us reduce the knowledge gap 
on the workings of factoring and the potentials. In conclusion, ladies and gentlemen, let me congratulate particularly the FITC and all of the stakeholders present at this event for their commitment, for their passion, and all the hard work they put into this in seeing that factory really takes its place in the Nigerian financial system of the Nigerian economy and contribute its full potential to economic growth and development in Nigeria. Thank you very much for your kind attention. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Hassan, for that um, opening. And that also gives further context to our um, topic of discussion today. And we also um, are also happy to know the um, steps taken by the CBN and other stakeholders towards establishing a structured factoring industry in Nigeria. So um, right now, we'll be going to the panel session and I'll be introducing our moderator for today, who will take charge of the panel session. And our moderator for today is Mrs. Yewande Shuneyevon, and who is the general manager for Access Bank um, PLC. So uh, Mrs. Um, Shuneye, please um, let's have you to start the panel session. Thank you. Thank you, Shay. Hello, everyone. My name is um, Yuan Dishunaya Vaughan, and I'm the Deputy General Manager in Axis Bank, and where I manage SME businesses. I will be moderating the session for today. Before I uh, introduce the, the panel, I would also like to give a bit of a background on the reason why we think, you know, factoring is a game changer for SME goods, as well as for the financial service providers. Looking at the statistics in um, MSMEs are really the backbone on a, of any economy, be it locally or internationally. Looking at the local perspectives, uh, MSMEs contribute about 48% of Nigerian GDP. 90% of the businesses in Nigeria are owned uh, SME, MSME businesses. And in terms of employment, about 84%. So in view of this, I mean, one would think that, I mean, uh, this area has a lot of growth potentials. But when you look at it from the financing perspective, only 0.3% of the facilities, credit facilities in the banking industries are available to MSMEs today, which means that annually we have about 617 billion financing gap for the MSMEs annually. So you will agree with me that we are looking at factoring as a source of bridging that gap is one of the most important thing we can be looking at into the future. So, on that note, I would like to uh, introduce our five panelists, including um, that as well, with Mr. Pisa Monroe as well. Uh, we have some amazing speakers here today who are leaders in their various fields, uh, and they have taken the time today to join us to be part of this exercise. The idea is for us to discuss extensively and see, find solutions around this so that we can see the kind of results we're seeing in China and um, coming down to Africa and also in South Africa going forward. So I would, do, I would like to do the introduction of uh, bring on board the panelists. So our first panelist will be Mr. Herrick Moncho Ntong, who is the Regional Chief Operating Officer at Afria Exim Bank. You're welcome to the program. Thank you very much, Madam. Okay, so we also have Mr. Hope Yongo, who is the Technical Advisor to the MD CEO Next in bank, you're welcome. I don't think Hope is on the call to, unfortunately. Okay. okay. So we have, we also have a uh, Mrs. Nika James, who is the tax partner at KPMG. I hope she's on. Mrs. Thank Nika you very James. much, Yuandi. Okay. Thank you. I'm here. Yeah. I'm happy to be here. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. We have Dr. Henry Emejo. The director, Nigerian Association of Small and Media Small Scale Industrialists. Thank you. Yeah, thank okay. you. And uh, we have Mr. Larry Bakari, the MD CEO, Factoring and Supply Chain Finance Limited. 
Is Mr. Lamy Bakri here? Yes, I just saw him. He's here, he's muted. You're, you're muted, okay. Mr. Lamy. Right, please could you unmute your device? Okay, so thank you everyone. Thank you for having me. Okay, thank you. Thank you, you're welcome to the program as well. So before we go ahead, I would like to take your permission for us to conduct the session using our first names. So I'll be so I'll, I'll be using um, Eric, Hope, Nikkei, Henry, Larry, and Peace. I hope that's okay. That's Thank fine. You. That's fine. Thank you. <laughs> okay, so let's start. Okay, um, the first question we'll be going to Mr. Larry Bakary. Um, would you, in simple terms, uh, explain briefly what factoring is and how it works? Okay, um, thank you very much, everybody. Um, and thank you to FITC for putting this together. Uh, in a layman's language, factoring is simply an assignment of interest in an executed contract, in an account receivables, um, whereby a vendor assigns the interest he has in a particular transaction to a financial institution in exchange for liquidity. So that is simple definition of factory so that our audience can follow us. Thank you. Okay. Um, it kind of sounds like invoice discounting, right? Um, and this question goes to Peter. Is there a difference between invoice discounting and factoring? And if there is, what are the differences? Well, let's start with the commonality. Uh, I mean, invoice discounting is part of the uh, factoring family. And what do I mean by that? Um, the United Nations defines factoring as the first and foremost act, which is the assignment or sale uh, of the account receivable to a third party and that third party being a factor. So if you have that that is the basis of what the UN defines as, as factoring in general. The family of this, this called this family of factoring and invoice discounting uh, requires uh, the assignment of the account. So it is part of uh, the factoring family. However, it is the lightest form of factoring. Um, <coughs> so what do I mean? Well, factoring involves uh, uh, four, four different services. The first being, um, the collection of the account. So when, when you purchase the receivable, the factor typically will collect on behalf of the seller uh, to ensure that the buyer pays. Uh, the second is the underwriting or the guarantee of the debtor. If the debtor files bankruptcy or defaults, the factor obligates itself to pay uh, either by way of the, the advance or pay later uh, to the seller uh, by way of a guarantee, a factor guarantee. Uh, the third, uh, is I call it management of the account. And that's, that's because you have issues like disputes, uh, disagreements uh, between the buyer and seller. So that has to be managed, that has to be processed. Uh, and then and fourth and lastly uh, is the ledgering. Uh, these receivables have to be on a factoring system uh, for it to be properly managed. Uh, and so there's an entire ledgering process that takes place. So. And, and it's very clear that the UN defines these different services as part of factor. But invoice discounting doesn't include any of them. Uh, it only includes the assignment and, and the finance, of course, and the finance. But in, in, in invoice discounting, the seller still collects. The seller, seller still takes the risk of the buyer debtor, buyer or debtor bankruptcies or defaults. Um, they, these receivables are not ledgered technically on a platform. Uh, so it's a lot different than traditional real factoring, which uh, does include all the things I mentioned previously. So yeah, it's part of the family uh, invoice discounting, but it's one of a, a number of different products. Okay, thank you. Thank you so much, Peter. Sure. Okay, following the, um, um, Peter's explanation, as well as the definition given by Larry earlier, uh, and this question goes to Henry. Um, Looking at the fact that factoring is a veritable financing option for MSMEs, do you think that MSMEs are aware of the potential benefit of factoring as a source of short-term financing? First and foremost, I would say um, FITC 
success for this wonderful advocacy program. Uh, Patron, as you see, is uh, been an, uh, a long term uh, activity in alternative funding of financial businesses. But you can see the, the, in Nigeria, the awareness is too small. But I'm, I must tell you that Patron is uh, just as the program say, it's a game changer because it's a way of uh, exchanging what's it called now, having a cash flow, cash flow management in order to mitigate uh, cash flow crunch to SMEs. So most have that our background, but the knowledge of its implementation is not well known to us as a research or participant. And then, uh, and then when Nigeria narrow way by, uh, bank are not willing to lend to uh, SMEs because of maybe the risk, but factory may, may uh, step in to mitigate that action. So I would say that we will have to increase our uh, uh, advocacy for Nigerians SME to know the importance of factoring and how it could actually increase their cash flow and then bring stability on their businesses. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, Henry. We appreciate that. Okay, so let's bring Eric into the conversation. Looking at uh, factoring from an international perspective, what do you think Nigeria can benefit from international factoring and the IFC FTA? Uh, thank you, Madam Moderator. Um, I, I think what, what Nigeria can benefit is huge. Um, but let me start by um, extending greetings from Mrs. Kanayo Awani, who is the chairperson of the FCA Africa chapter and the managing director for Inter-African Trade uh, Initiative from Africa Zimba. Uh, I'm actually speaking on her, on her behalf, um, as well as Professor Benedict Orama, the president of Africa Zimba, who is uh, a loyalist and a champion for factory um, in, uh, in Africa. Uh, my apologies for that. You know, <laughs> because they, they wasted a bit of time, other things start pushing. But thank you. Um, what Nigeria has to benefit is very, very huge. And I will just tell you a few things. Uh, according to a study that Africa Zimbabwe and the African Development Bank conducted in 2019, trade finance gap in Africa was put at more than 81 billion US dollars. That's a very big gap. Uh, and then you note that. Only 40% of trade finance in Africa is financed by banks. So only 40%. If you compare this to Europe and other developed markets, more than 80% of the trade finance gap is financed by banks. Now, of those who suffer most from uh, this huge trade finance gap uh, are the MSMEs that you've uh, been be talking about. The gap is huge, uh, and these are the most impacted. The SMEs employ, like you rightly said at the introduction, uh, more than 70% of the workforce. Yet, more than 80% of them who apply for facilities in Nigeria and Africa are declined. So you see, those MSMEs who account for a huge rate of employment of our workforce, they approach the traditional banks uh, for financing and they are declined because they don't have the sophistication that is required by the risk acceptance criteria of the financial institutions. This is the situation in Nigeria. That is why factoring is actually a game changer. When I read the theme of this event, I was really thrilled by it. It's a game changer because there are so many SMEs in Nigeria which are impacted. Uh, because of this trade finance gap. And that is why, because of this, Afrexim Bank, uh, Nexim, FSS 2020, Central Bank of Nigeria, FCI, have been working hard to promote um, the awareness which uh, Harry uh, uh, highlighted uh, earlier when he was presenting. Awareness, because a lot of the SMEs are not aware that there's an alternative finance solution, they are not aware, it's a very huge problem. As well as the capacity, 
the understanding of taking advantage of the factory opportunities that are available. And also the regulators need to understand that factoring is not traditional banking. Factoring uh, is the purchase of receivables. The receivable provides a source of repayment. The receivable also serves as a collateral. That is why the word assignment is exclusively or has been extensively used by Peter, by a previous speaker. That receivable has to be assigned so that it provides that comfort. And for this to happen, the, the legal environment has to be there. We've been working with the partners that I mentioned to promote the factoring uh, bill at the, at the National Assembly to be passed. Uh, we'll be working with the CBN to enact the regulation that will guide uh, the as uh, process of factoring transaction. So once that receivable is assigned, then you have title, it's a full transfer of asset. It can now serve as a source of repayment. It can now be able to uh, protect you in the event of uh, uh, any default. Now, if this is done, not only with the awareness, make the MSMEs become uh, familiar with factoring, they'll be able to utilize it. So, uh, to wrap, uh, wrap up, Afrex Zimbang and his partners have identified MSMEs as the key players to promote trade under the AFCFT because they are flexible, because it's easier to make decisions. So these SMEs need the financial models to be able to trade. They need to produce the goods and services that needed to be traded. The AFCFT is providing a bigger market and Nigeria being the biggest uh, market in Africa, needs to position itself to uh, enforce the capacity, financial capacity, as well as the technical capacity of the MSMEs, and who then in turn drive trade under the AFCFTA. Nigeria will manufacture, uh, as per statistic, Nigeria exports 20% of what they, they produce and import only about uh, uh, 7%, which means if these MSMEs are financially capacitized, and technically capacitized, they will be able to take advantage. And of course, Nigeria will play a key role in promoting trading on, under the AFCFTA. Let me stop there for now. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. I'd like to still throw that question to Peter as well, uh, coming from the international outside Africa perspective, uh, in terms of process, because this is the export part of the business. And we have a lot of Nigerian MSME exporters. How would this work? Yeah, um, thank you so much, Yamanda. And uh, I think Eric you know, said it well in the sense that <clears throat> you know, um, the whole concept of factoring is control, yeah. okay? And this is why uh, the financial community needs to adopt it because it allows to, to, uh, to drill down to SMEs that are typically, typically not bankable or typically not capable of obtaining traditional, let's say unsecured uh, financing. And the control mechanisms allow the banks and financial institutions to uh, uh, ins you know, ensure they get repaid at the end of the day, provide liquidity to SMEs and get repaid through the buyers. And so, uh, but it, of course, to your point, Yawanda, international it makes it even more challenging. So how do you do that? Um, and the, the, the best way, of course, is to do it the way FCI uh, professes. Um, FCI has a global platform called Eddy Factoring. It's a messaging system like Swift, and it allows companies to, uh, members to, let's say like a Nigerian exporter uh, wants to, ha they have a receivable, the buyer is in the United States. So th the member in Nigeria would finance that receivable, but through the Eddy Factoring, through the FCI platform. And wh why does that help? Because uh, it provides a number of, let's say, uh, uh, security elements. First and foremost, um, the, uh, the the Nigerian factor would use a factor in the United States, a member of FCI, to guarantee the risk, to collect uh, the receivable when it becomes due, uh, and if they don't pay, to, to provide a dunning or a legal collection service, uh, to manage any dispute risks that come up, yeah. to ensure and avoid fraud, uh, to ensure that the buyer is legitimate, to ensure that the buyer acknowledges the invoice, acknowledges the transaction, um, and to 
to receive the payment from the buyer. So the buyer will then would pay a local account in the United States in US dollars. And then those dollars then would be uh, repatriated back to Nigeria uh, by the member in the United States. So it's a highly controlled mechanism to ensure that the uh, factor who is financing those receivables gets paid. Now, <clears throat> there are other ways to do it uh, that are hot, more risky. Uh, that you like an exporter export uh, exporter can go to a bank or a financial institution to factor those receivables and, and that bank can do it on their own. They could take the risk on the buyer. They can take the dilution risk. They can take the fraud risk. They could take the uh, bankruptcy risk of the buyer. But that's a gamble. That's like going to Las Vegas, you know, especially when you're dealing with buyers halfway around the world. So this is the uh, this is the why we have this system in place. There's other protection elements like credit insurance. Um, so you can also use credit insurance to uh, ensure that the buyer pays. And if they don't, they can claim against that policy uh, with the insurer. Uh, and there are other means by which to protect your receivables, but I can't get into it today. But so that's how, that's how typically uh, uh, factors and banks uh, uh, protect themselves is through the FCI platform or through an insurance policy uh, that that also FCI can help uh, manage uh, and protect the uh, the factor. Thank you, Peter. Thank you. Okay, uh, so let's look at it from the um, um, SMEs MSMEs perspective. So that I will be addressing this question to Mr. to Henry. Um, now that we know what factoring out is, uh, we know how it works. We've looked at the benefits both locally and internationally. What would you say? Are the, are, the, are the most pertinent challenge, challenges in the adop, adoption of factoring by the MS, SMAs themselves? I want to thank you for that question. When, when you look at it, uh, at a sense, the, there is a lack of information. Major challenge is lack of information about factoring in Nigeria. And then there is also lack of a legal framework and of questionability of, of, of the operations of uh, factory in Nigeria. And then who are the participants, the factors? These are not known. And then how do we affect uh, the, the buyer, the seller, and then the factor? What are the difference between the three? These informations are not in the public domain, especially in the uh, uh, MSME or uh, industry. Uh, perspective. So if we must move forward, we must have a clear call, just like uh, uh, acting director of uh, FSS 2020 said, we must increase the knowledge gap so we can uh, um, MSM in Nigeria, the industrial and entrepreneurs should know these are what is available, uh, the, the, the capacity of factoring uh, as an alternative financing for their businesses. So if these informations are not clearly in the public domain, and then and I have a kind of a, a concept that is working, and we may have to have a kind of a, a trial versions between the uh, export motion bank and then uh, Nizen, and then put all of them together, and then uh, and see what works for this uh, MSMEs, and then have a, a kind of a, a testing. So we can have a typical example and say this is how it works. Because as it is right now, nobody will tell you in Nigeria, this is how it works. And then there's no testimonies who say, okay, this person have uh, had a uh, factoring as an alternative financing, and they have successfully uh, uh, passed through that process uh, through the, 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 the seller, the buyer, and the factor. So when you look at those uh, chains, you can see that there's a lot of, uh, uh, there's a disconnect. And then until that disconnect is bridged, and then we can understand exactly how it works. Yeah. It, it, may, it, it may not be possible for us to uh, give it a, a, a whole backing. But if, as we begin to understand now, and then we begin to preach it and say, this is an uh, alternative to uh, financing that is not loan, and then uh, that is quite uh, accessible when uh, banks say no to you, and then you can actually have uh, alternative options to finance your businesses. I think that is it. So if I may summarize it and what I mean, number one, there's a need for uh, uh, one, one major problem is the knowledge gap. Number two is uh, uh, who are the factors? And then number three is how 
the the reliability uh, or the credibility of the of the buyer and not the seller right now who is actually the producer now but the buyer so these are the things and then what is the, the the supply chain mechanism so we can be able to know even the factor we understand that the buyer that is buying your product is credible so when we look at it on those uh, uh, perspective i think uh, if that could be taken care of we can begin to see uh, uh, how it can be adopted and then before i round up there should also be a legal framework which i know that is ongoing so if that can be conclusively done and then the advocacy uh, increase i think we may be getting nigeria uh, pushing high like a hero. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, Harry, would you like to address some of these challenges? Do you have other, uh, anything to add? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I think I think the major challenge, major challenge, is uh, Harry has highlighted quite, but I just want to emphasize there are two things here. One, we need a legal a law. Yeah. The law is very important. Two, we need regulation. And I give you why it is, uh, why I call the major challenges, those two. Today, if somebody has a receivable, goes to Larry Bakary, who is here uh, present, I said, I want, to, I want you to discount this receivable. What a regulation which exists now from the central bank is that for Nare to purchase those receivable, um, the, the, the person who has the receivable needs to bring additional collateral. Okay. That's what the regulation says. Yeah. So first thing we need to change the regulation. Like I said at the beginning, uh, a receivable is an asset. If you look at the balance sheet, it's in the liquid, uh, it's a liquid asset of the balance sheet. Or, uh, so it can be sold off. And for it to be sold off, it needs to be properly assigned. Yeah. So if the regulation recognizes that this is an asset, as well as this is a source of repayment, then they don't need to ask for another collateral. collateral. But what exists right now is that for you to have uh, your receivable purchase, you need to bring an additional collateral on top of the receivable. And these are MSMEs. They don't have those assets. They don't have those. They don't have. If this were the case that the, for you to sell off your receivables, you don't need to bring additional collaterals, lack of information will disappear because once it is working, a lot of people will be flowing Larry's office, going to all the other offices uh, that are offering factory services. And very, very soon the information will spread like wildfire. With social media today, everybody will know. And then people will now get interest and start training themselves. That lack of information will disappear. Is because the regulation doesn't provide the enabling value. And of course, for the assignment to happen, the law needs to be there. These are the two yeah. major things that we need to. The last yeah. point Thank I just you, want to highlight. Thank you, Eric. I'm going to come back to you later on what on okay. the regulation, what is happening with the government um, later in the on the course of this uh, discussion. So please bear with me. Okay, so let's kick things up a notch. Well, looking at things, let's cross over to tax considerations. Um, in developing an efficient factoring framework, what are the specific tax regulations that could impact the industry? And this question is for Nike. I guess as much being the only <laughs> tax person on this panel. So thank you very much, Yitzhi. And uh, that's a very interesting and insightful question. And you know, I must first say that during the course of this discussion, we've heard words like assignment of the receivables, purchase of the receivables by the factor, sale by the you know, business owner, what have you. And that goes to the crux of the matter. And there are two major issues that we would have to address in, us, in order for us to address the tax issues. And one is first, what really is the substance of these factor operations? Is it akin to like a credit facility whereby, you know, you collateralize the, the facility, so to speak, on the, um, on the receivables, which is like a security for it? Or do you see it really as a service that is being done on which a fee is being paid? And the second issue is actually about ownership, which has been that a lot of times I've heard about outright, you know, it's tight change of title. But really, is that what happens all the time? Is that an outright ownership or transfer of ownership? Who really owns these um, receivables? Because 
ownership and accounting will go hand in hand. If the ownership is with the factor, you will have to account for it in its books and the tax treatment will follow suit. You know, currently based on the drafts bill that has been released, what is said there is that the factor earns a fee for the factoring operations. And if it provides additional services, a fee. And that also has implication. Is it always a fee or is this really, you know, something else? And um, let me just give you some of the insights of what can happen based on how you see it. If, for instance, we see this as a service that a fee is being paid on, then that means that fee for tax purposes is liable to VAT. However, if it's really being seen like a set of credit facility on which, you know, the factor actually provides the credit to the MSME or, you know, business owner, and then the collateral serves as a security for it, then that means the income that the factor is making is akin to like your interest income that a bank will make when you give loans. And that's like a return on investment and VAT will not be applicable. We find mm -hmm. out for instance, in the UK, VAT is not applicable because the income from factoring is not deemed to be a supply that is liable to VAT. But if the factor provides other services, like Peter mentioned, there are different other things that come in, administration and everything, and it earns a fee, then VAT will be applicable on those other services. So those clarity is very important from a regulatory perspective, not to unduly expose you know, the factoring business to taxes that were not um, uh, that, that were not understood. Let me talk about another one, stamp duties. You know, and that goes to the issue about, is this an outright you know, yeah. sale transfer of ownership. Now, if this is an outright transfer of ownership from the business owner to the factor, then that is like a conveyance on sale. Under the Nigerian Stamp Duties Act, you can have stamp duties as high as 1.5% of the value of the receivables being transferred. So if we're talking about like receivables of 1 billion, that is 15 million already, which is an, a leakage, so to speak, that you would expose it to. But if it was seen as like kind of um, you know, credit facility, and all you're doing is that this receivable serve as securitization collateral. Stamp duties on such an instrument can be like 0 0.375. So there are differences, and this has different cost output. I, there are other issues, but I think you just want to have a bit of it, and probably when you come back to we can talk about it. But, but these but are you've issues. Covered, you've covered my next question. <laughs> you've actually. <laughs> So thank you very much for that. Thank you so much for that. Yeah, but what I want to say is that because of that, it's laudable that you have a draft bill, but I think the regulators also need to speak with those in the accounting field, understand how this accounting, how this will be accounted for, understand if that is the intention so that the regulations can be clear on these issues. Likewise, the tax authorities also need to come to the field to understand what this factoring business and potential tax issues such that at the end of the day, we don't have an issue, a situation whereby they undue tax exposures. I take, for instance, a product like securities lending that was launched a few years back. It was fraught with a lot of tax issues, but luckily the SEC was able to sit with the FRS and with, with um, operators in the industry. And eventually with, um, tax adjustments were brought into the tax laws to ensure that it creates a level playing field and those who go into securities lending are not unduly exposed to tax. I see a situation like that being necessary for factoring. Otherwise, those tax costs will create further exposures that can then discourage the players from going into that field. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Nika. Okay, so I'm going to jump a bit because I think Nika had touched on some areas that I think at this point, we need to now talk about the Nigerian factoring bill. Um, and I'll bring that, I'll take that question to Eric. Eric, could you give us, um, what is the Nigerian factoring bill? And then do they take into consideration some of these things that Nikke has just mentioned? Because uh, if they don't, then um, if it is passed, would it still address, would it have addressed issues that we still we have with factoring? Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Yawande. Um, first, let me let me highlight that um, with our partners, Afrex Zimbang, uh, FCI, CBN, Nexum, FSS Twenty Twenty, we 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 saw this problem and we came together to start seeing how we can solve them. And and Nikkei has very beautifully painted some, and I'm going to give her exa an example shortly now to confirm what she was saying uh, in Congo. Uh, where 
factoring actually started. In fact, they have just passed their law uh, two months ago in the Congo Brazzaville, that means Republic of Congo, not DRC. They just passed their law and we had a, an event there that just uh, ended uh, two weeks ago. Uh, what happened there with taxi was that the, the tax authorities misunderstood what is a receivable that is not yet due and what is a receivable that is past due. Mm -hmm. So there is a, a, a higher levy on a receivable, receivable that is past due. They just lump up everything and start over taxing. So an SME who is very poor, who doesn't have a lot of money, brings a 100,000, say 100,000 uh, Naira for you to discount. And then for, for him or her to register the contract, he has to pay a certain percent, 4.5% and so on. Uh, they started saying, no, 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 no. I better wait for my invoice to mature and pay. But when, once they're waiting, uh, they are losing other opportunities that they would, would have taken. Over. That's why Africa Zimbabwe worked with these partners some years back to answer your question, Yawande, to develop a factory model law, model law that took into consideration uh, international factoring best practices took into con consideration the peculiar peculiarity of Africa, um, where we have uh, English uh, principles of English law in Anglo-Saxon Africa, uh, principles of uh, French law, civil law in Francophone Africa, uh, the, those peculiarities in South Africa and uh, Zimbabwe, which, which are principles of Roman Dutch law and so on, and develop a, a factory model law and launched in October 2016 for member countries to use, then adopt, telomec so that it can suit their own peculiarities. And this work has been used by Egypt, by Congo, and now the uh, eight countries of the BCA or Francophone West Africa are using them to, 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 to uh, enshrine their own laws. And that's what is being used here in, in, in Nigeria. Now we work with FSS 2020 and NEXM to take into consideration, as well as FCI, to consider the peculiarity of Nigeria, the Nigerian market. SMEs don't have a lot of money. When Nike was speaking, she's talking about fee being uh, vertebral and uh, uh, the other uh, interest which will not attract VAT. But they, while the government has the responsibility to correct, collect these revenues from taxes, they also have the responsibility to combat poverty. And those players are SMEs. We need to understand we are going to apply these laws or the tax rates to SMEs who typically don't have a lot of money. So who are you taxing? If I ask you to pay uh, $100 million as taxes, when you, you don't even make up to that kind of money. Are you going to have it? So I think the peculiarity of the law should take into consideration who are the SMEs, who are going to be the highest users of factoring services. And these are the MSMEs. And if they are MSMEs, how much do they typically have by way of turnover? How can that be done? And the solution to it will be just charge a flat rate. This is what was done in Cameroon. By the way, I'm from Cameroon. And Cameroon has a factory law. What was applicable there by way of avoiding these issues of overtaxing and discouraging uh, the factory services was just to look at a flat amount of 20,000 for a factory transaction, very flat, so as to encourage. And this is what has been working. So I think in Nigeria, this is what needs to be considered. Who are these SMEs? How much money can they really? I think the role of the government in fighting poverty will be more to support them rather than overtax them and then discourage the, 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 the factory services and thereby discouraging the SMEs who are supposed to play a critical role in the promotion of trade under the AFCFT. Thank you very much. You're muted. You're muted. Uh, Madam Chair. I didn't realize I was muted. Thank you for that. So uh, I, I said that, Nikkei, would you like to comment on what uh, Herrick has just said? 
Does it mean that when the factoring law comes out, it might not solve, have solved our problem, the problems we are already facing today? Okay, thank you very much, Yowande, and very beautiful um, comments that Eric made there. And really, I must say that the factoring bill, as it is right now, does not solve the problems. Um, I don't know what level of exposure draft this is, whether this is the final. I know in recent times, some maybe they've asked for some comments from some of the associations. So I, I'm not sure whether that has been factored into this bill yet. But obviously, I think there are two legs. One, of, one is on the bill itself if there can be further clarity, except if as it is, because I take note of what Eric said, that is best standard and global standard, and that's the template that has been used for this. Then the other leg, if that has been fully done, then the other leg would have to be on the tax side. Tax incentives don't flow through just like that. A mm. case must be made for it. And FRS needs to be brought to the joint board, you know, to the table to sit down, with um, the other party players to understand what factoring is. And it's either in the act itself, you put provisions that ensure that you don't create a tax leakage, or you then ask FRS to amend the tax laws and do, do, and do so. And oftentimes it might be easier for you to put the tax bit into the law right now, since maybe this has gone further up. If you are waiting for the tax laws to be changed, then there's gonna be a mismatch. This yeah. law comes out, but the tax issues are still there and God knows which year the laws will be changed. And we're going into an election year. So in terms <laughs> of attention, focus, diversion, all manner of things can happen. So you can have a law that has been passed, but effectiveness is a problem because other issues need to be treated. So I would advise that the parties come together now mm -hmm. and see how to address the tax issues alongside other matters on factory. Thank you. Beautifully said. Thank you so much, Nika. Thank you. Okay, so over to Larry. Um, some of these uh, challenges that we've mentioned now, coming from the financial service industry, um, what's your perspective? Um, Larry. Please go ahead. Oh, okay. I said, coming from the, um, what do you think the, I mean, we've talked about um, the, uh, the banks are not financing, uh, they're not doing uh, factoring because of the, the VIX factor and other things. And then we are looking, uh, we're looking at factoring today as a game changer. Despite all these uh, challenges and threats and all that, how do you, market participants in the financial service industry, how do we, what do you think their take will be in the future? looking at this as a bridging gap uh, for financing? Okay, um, thank you very much, uh, you are there for that question. But before I answer that question, I would like to take us back uh, slightly. Mm. Yes, we might not have um, the law right away, but there's, an, there's a legislation, the Secure Transaction Removable Asset Act that created the collateral registry. That legislation, that piece of legislation gave um, created security interest in receivables. And for me, that's a, that, that's a milestone from Central Bank and the, uh, the people that put it together there. So yes, the essence of that legislation was to support SMEs so that, of course, they don't have uh, assets they can pledge to the like of Assets Bank and of this world. They could use their asset, you know, their movable asset for collateral. Mm -hmm. So that piece of legislation, so also help who are discussing today, because that legislation uh, make receivables not just as a source of repayment, but as a repayment, I mean, as, as, a, um, as an asset that can be pledged by SMEs. So that is one side. I need to put that in context. Um, you talk about the participants in the industry, the financial services industry. Uh, the other thing, apart from that legislation, that was a, a 2017 legislation. And that legislation uh, gave Nigeria higher ranking in this of doing business, if you all remember. So for me, that's a milestone, um, and that's a substantive law. Why we're waiting for the refactoring model law in National Assembly. Having said that, the other gray areas or the other impediments which the regulators and stakeholders have also address is the issue of the credit guarantee. I mean, um, um, credit guarantee. Um, regulation put out by Central Bank early this year because 
no matter how much we have on our balance sheets, I always say this, if we cannot the risk, we can deploy. So the issue of credit guarantee, credit insurance come into play. And I'm happy what Central Bank has done. And uh, they've put up the regulations. Uh, they put up the, the, the requirement for a, a, a credit guarantee company to be established by uh, the institutions or whoever's interested. So those are the other ways I believe um, it will jumpstart the process. Because the, the, the reality is this, factoring is going to help small businesses, no doubt. But if you don't have a credible counterparties, because the repayment is coming from the counterparties. Yeah. If your counterparties are not credible, nobody won't take your risk. Of course, with the issue of credit guarantee, so it can also help, it helps. But the primary repayment source, you must remember, is your counterparties. You know, it is the risk, like Peter said earlier, so um, uh, the SMEs of this world don't have access to credit because of so many reasons, uh, with balance sheets and so on and so forth, you know. But in factoring, um, the, the factor is looking at who are the counterparties of these guys. So that can buy their receivables, that can provide liquidity to those SMEs, you know. Because when you also look at the cycle, um, an average SME would prefer to have advanced payments as against going for credit. If you have a receivables from a counterparties, they want to take it from you. They want to this kind of receivable and give you liquidity so that in the 30 days or 90 days cycles, you can actually do a three transaction or four transactions and bring one and go and wait for payments. So for me, it's really a game changer, but the regulations, the um, all the things that we need to do, I, I believe is taking shape gradually. Now we have um, on the regulation side, CBN is also working on the regulation with Nexen Bank, with African Bank, with GIZ, where we're waiting the final law of the National Assembly. Um, CBN has also gone ahead to uh, come up with a credit guarantee company for people to, I mean, um, apply for license so that they can help the risk all these things we're doing. So for me, um, it, it's, a, it's a very, it's a giant leap um, we're getting into our of course, eventually, when we have the regulations, like what happened in Egypt and other places, we are going to have more players in that sector. Of course, bank will also want to come on board uh, to be part of that, uh, uh, to be part of that uh, uh, ecosystem. Of course, they have to do that by, um, um, like, a subsidiary company because CBN want to make sure they, they um, safeguard the depositors' fund. So, of course, that's how it happens in other clients, and I'm sure. That's a trend I see happening here in Nigeria. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Larry. Okay, um, so my final question would go to um, Henry, and I also like Pisa's input after. Um, we've discussed the issues that we have around factoring, the challenges that are there, the things that we need to do as a country to bridge that gap so that we can have, um, we can grow, uh, uh, the MSMEs in Nigeria can have access to financing from factoring. So, um, and this question, the first question for Henry, looking into five years from now, assuming that all these things are uh, managed and that we have the right laws and some of these challenges, are we, are, are we are able to mitigate them? Where do you see factoring in Nigeria in the next five years? Uh, thank you very much, John. I think, uh, it will actually be a true game changer. In fact, it is actually stand as a game changer because if all regulations and laws are put in place, and then the players that need to play on that space are also well informed, actually we will come to a point that we say that factory will become a game changer, and then it could compete favorably like uh, in other uh, uh, countries like Europe, whereby factory have been a, a major player in economic uh, development in supporting and uh, bridging the gap of financial uh, burdens. So when you look at it, I was saying five years time, um, if all things been equal, if uh, uh, political and then uh, economic indices move well, and then um, we do the need for the CBN, the or other partners, GIZ and everybody uh, do what they're supposed to do. And then the private sector also make their necessary input. I think we should be able to build, we should be as a nation. 
and then I think that's it uh, in a random note. And then I would say, uh, I would just say one more thing before I drop. It, 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 you know, I said there is a set of participants. I will say that factoring will help us bridge the gap of financial need. And then if properly conducted, who will participate? We will also bring our members to make sure that we do the training and then we also give, uh, uh, open up the understanding so they will know that these are the needs and then these are why we have, we have to involve in the factoring uh, as an alternative financing in Nigeria. And then if that happens, we will say that uh, we sell our members, look, this is the way to go. And, and then I say um, a, a part of uh, organized private sector in Nigeria will also push uh, uh, on, in, in the factoring uh, as alternative funding to make sure that everybody gets involved and, and, and then to actually help the small businesses to grow. Because the essence is that when the knowledge is there uh, and then uh, we have uh, 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 the, the financial gap is breached, what happens is that we see productivity, we, we see quality of our services, and then we see healthy economy. And then for us to have healthy economy, all the financial derivatives to, to funding gap should be breached, and then factoring is a key. And then if that happens, I think uh, in this meeting, I will tell us that uh, as a NASA as an organization will be a, a, a very solid uh, the backing for that project. I will hope that the, the laws that are being drafted will be informed on how it is going for input. And then if there's any other thing that needs to be done, I think we're available. Thank, thanks uh, um, FITC for the invite. And then we we'll hope that we we'll make, if there's another input you could want us to do, we're here to do it. Thank you very much. Thank you, our moderator. And thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Henry. Yes, sir. Thank you. So, Peter, the perspective I want you to address on this uh, projection for Nigeria is based on what is happening on factoring all over globally. You know, Africa alone um, contributes about 1% to factoring worldwide. And uh, out of that, South Africa is the major contributor to that. So based on some of the things we've discussed here, the challenges and the, the risk and all those other things that in terms of uh, mitigants to uh, protect uh, the financial institutions and also find opportunities um, so that the MSMEs can uh, take advantage of the potentials. How would you, what's your projection in the next five years, taking all those things into consideration? Mm. And um, yeah, what's your projection for Nigeria in the next five years? Uh, well, uh, I think uh, my friends who are on the line who know me uh, know that I am extremely bullish uh, for factoring in, in Nigeria. To me, Nigeria is a the, the most perfect uh, example of a country that is in desperate need of the product. So <laughs> the demand will be there, okay? Uh, there, 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 factoring is like a four-legged legged stool or a four-legged chair. Um, you have to have the regulations to allow for factoring. You have to have a lot, you have to be able to instill confidence in that investor. That's the most important thing. The investors will bring the capital to the market through a factoring structure. But um, uh, if those regulations and, and uh, Nike, Nike mentioned uh, the tax issues, if those tax issues are not properly addressed, and trust me, I wanted to mention when she was talking about taxes and stamp duty and things, if, if, the, if the regime is not uh, perfected in a way that uh, seamlessly allows the growth of factory and, 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 and hinders it, um, trust me, it's gonna be you know, like having a, a stool with uh, uh, one leg. <laughs> so so you, know, you, have to, you have to have the regulations, you have to have the tax, proper tax policies, you have to have the law you know, to, to have the permission to allow for the assignment. And then you have to have the education. You have, the education is key because it's a cultural evolution. And I'm not just talking about small the SMEs. Um, I'm also talking about the banks and non-banks themselves. Um, especially banks. Banks are conservative by nature. They have to be able to um, to, to 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 culturally change from a, from a, a structure that finances against things that you can touch and feel to things that are are invisible, like a, like a receivable, and and pro and providing working capital against these invisible assets 
but they these assets if they're if they're legalized within the within the Nigerian system then they should have the same uh, value as a house or any other uh, asset class uh, that's legalized within the within the structure and and so five years from now uh, if if all these legs of the stool are in place to me the sky's the limit um, uh, you know every country that we have seen the adoption of regulation proper tax harmony proper uh, 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 um, education and, and, and adapt adoption uh, uh, and and a proper and, and formal uh, factoring association mm -hmm. so a bottom-up approach versus a top-down approach to me this is the, this is the final leg of the stool you have a perfect system and there you go uh, explosive growth and you could say you know I, if I gosh I wish I could remember uh, what the number was, but I estimated that uh, you know the average uh, country in the in the world uh, is about five percent of their GDP. I forget the no GDP number in Nigeria, but you take five percent of the GDP in Nigeria, that could be your target uh, uh, in, in terms of a market, a factoring market within the next within the next decade. Once all the all the pieces are are in proper place. Yeah. Thank you so much, Peter. Thank you. Ah, this has been an exciting, educative, and very insightful session, I must say. Um, we talked about factoring, we defined factoring, explained, and was explained at the beginning of the session. We looked at factoring outside Africa and the potentials um, within Nigeria as well. And then we also, of course, looked at the challenges, uh, the need for regulation, impact of tax, uh, lack of awareness, impact of supply chain management, all those things were discussed. And uh, we rounded it up by looking at where the opportunities are there. Once all these boxes are ticked and uh, uh, the market is there for us to take uh, factoring to the next level in Nigeria. Um, do we have any last thoughts, final words from our panelists? Our panelists, um, Larry, would you like to say anything, Eric, as we round up? Uh, excuse me, but you have you do have questions in your in your Q and A there that that people have written. You may want to address those okay. as well. Yes. So um, um, after this session, uh, Shay, you will be taking those questions. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Right. I think for me, uh, Madam Moderator, just to round up that uh, one of the key ingredients that can make us grow patrimony in Nigeria and of course in Africa is that we have to believe in it. Uh, commencing factoring comes with challenges. We talked about the various challenges, awareness, this MSMEs don't have the sophistication in preparing financial statements and so uh, as per typically uh, accepted risk acceptance criteria. Um, it's something that goes with challenges and we have to have passion for it. We have to know that it's a, it's a solution that has been used by other regions in like Europe to come out of crisis. Post Second World War is through factoring that Europe emerged uh, and you see the way it is done in Europe uh, and in Asia. Financial institutions, banks actually set up subsidiaries specialized in that. Uh, is to call on a financial institution in Nigeria, commercial banks in Nigeria to consider factoring because uh, chasing big corporates has a limit and big corporates always squeeze through pricing. The factoring, because it has the risk, the return will also be higher. It's an opportunity for banks in, in Nigeria to grow their balance, to grow their revenues by focusing on SMEs with these specialized um, uh, solutions. It's a secure solution. So we need to believe in it. We need to weather the storm. Uh, we need to bring in everybody to the table be the, the regulators, the lawmakers, the practitioners, and, and, and what have you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eric. Uh, okay. last, last word from you. Yes. Um, just a last word for me. Um, just to corroborate what Eric had just said. Uh, for me in Nigeria, we have um, what it takes. And I believe we are gradually connecting all the dots the issue of regulations, the issue of credit guarantee, the issue of stakeholder engagements. Uh, yes, the law will come eventually by this by advocacy of FCI, Afrexim Bank, Nexim Bank, 
So I'm very optimistic that um, in a few years from now, we are going to see the impact, all this effort we are putting in place to make sure factory actually takes root in Nigeria will see to fruition. I'm very clear about that. That's going to happen. So I also want to use the opportunity to thank uh, FITC and to thank African Bank and FCI, who have been supporting us since all this journey for the past few years. Yeah. Um, it's been a pleasure working with everybody, and I hope we can take this further uh, into the, um, I, mean, I mean, this engagement further so that we can have a more robust factory working group in Nigeria. Thank you. Okay. Uh, final thoughts from you, Peter. Sorry, I'm muted. Yeah, no, I mean, uh, I think I, I made my comments pretty clear. Um, you know, I, I, I just remember this one slide uh, from the United Nations of what they anticipate the expected population growth to be in Nigeria. And you know, Nigeria is going to be the third most populated country in the world by 2060. I mean, it is just a bastion of opportunity for the uh, for the, for the growth of factoring. Uh, I I view it, Nigeria as the most prominent country in Africa, and it's why FCI spent so much time, energy, together with our partner, the Africa Bank and Nexim, uh, and uh, FS Twenty Twenty, all all the parties. Um, and uh, you know, we are we. Are, we're, and we will continue to. I, I was a little disappointed, to be honest, the last two years, and things went really quiet during COVID. Mm -hmm. um, but <laughs> I'm happy to see things are rebounding now. Things are kind of coming out, and uh, I really hope things can speed up. Yeah. We all agree with you. Uh, thank you, Peter. Nick, a final thoughts? Thank you. And it's just to reiterate that, yes, factoring has great potentials in Nigeria, and particularly for our MSMEs. So it's important that the tax issues also be put into consideration such that it doesn't end up being the spanner in the works when you know it's now time for it to take up full board. So thank you very much. Thank you. And thank you to all our panelists. We are so, I mean, you've been fantastic throughout the session. Um, uh, we are sure our audience have taken a, a lot away from the session that we've had. And I, we all look forward to seeing Factoring as a real game changer for financing in, in, in Nigeria. So thank you, everybody. Wow. Thank you, thank you very much, um, Wande, for moderating that session. It's been a knowledge-filled, engaging session. I mean, I was just hooked to my system, just listening and absorbing all the information. Thank you all panelists for your time, for sharing your knowledge. I think this has been a very great um, platform for advocacy, which you have all um, alluded to, which is also a challenge for the industry. And for us at FIT, we we'll continue to bring everyone together to ensure that all stakeholders are engaged, brainstorm to establish this industry with so much potential for Nigeria. So thank you once again for this session. Um, before we go, we'd like to take um, a group photo. So we'd like everyone to come on video so that we can take it. Okay. Ebuka is not here. Um, Henry, please let everyone come on video. Okay, Nika, you have two devices. Okay, I can see that. Okay, do you need me to take off a device? Or it's okay? okay? Maybe that would be good so that we know we can see everyone. We'll still have the Q&A session. I can see someone asking. We just want to take a picture with all the panelists before we go into Q&A. All right, um, technology team, I hope you've taken the picture. Or do you want to give a smile? <laughs> All right, thank you very much. So without wasting much time, I know uh, because we started late, we've also taken more time. We'll quickly go into the Q&A, and I know quite a number of questions have been posted on the um, platform. Mm -hmm. And the first question that we will answer today, um, 
is from Obi Anoye, and he's asking, how does factoring help an MSME owner who is denied a loan him to produce and sell before he can generate a factorable receivable? I don't know if you heard that. I can, I can answer very quickly, uh, yeah. simply too, because it's a great question because it really differentiates the, you know, the difference between a loan and a factoring transaction. And a, and a loan is a two way, is a one way street. You know, you have a borrower and, 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 a, and a lender and you give money to the borrower and the borrower gives back the money to the lender. In factoring, it's a triangle. You know, you give money to the seller, the creator of the invoice, but your source of repayment is the buyer at the bottom of the triangle. So, um, and, and normally, uh, typically, uh, the buyer is stronger than the seller, especially if it's an SME. So uh, you're replacing the credit risk of the seller with the buyer, buyer's balance sheet with the buyer's credit risk. And this is the advantage. So uh, this is why if they're rejected uh, in, in a loan, the chances that they'll get approved under a factory transaction are much greater because again, the controls and the replacement of the credit risk from the seller to the buyers. All right, thank you very much, Peter, for that. We have a second question here. Um, this has to do with um, the construction industry. Um, this is an anonymous attendee who wants to know in simple terms how he or she can grow his business using factory in Nigeria. And the second part to that is that the company is actually into construction and he has lost several businesses in the past due to lack of funding to execute the projects. So basically, uh, the attendee wants to know how factoring can help in his construction. Um, I think um, Larry will help with that. Okay, um, thank you very much for that question. If she's into construction and she has um, receivables, you know, these days the way construction is done in Nigeria, if you want to buy a flat, they possibly ask you to have pay 30 or 40 percent. So technically, she has a receivable of 40 percent left. So I believe um, is something um, we can look at. Okay. But not, not to give her money to go and buy material for supplies. No, that's not factory. That's pure funding. But if she's the construction and she has receivable from people who are committed to her, and those people are so credible that other parties, then I believe she can access uh, finance. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. There's another um, question here, which um, more or less relates to other sectors and their role in factoring. And we've talked about credit guarantee, credit insurance. What that means is that the insurance industry has a role to play. So this question is basically um, asking around what, what role will the insurance industry and maybe the capital markets play in facilitating factoring? Okay, I'll leave Eric to answer that. Okay, um, I think the, the, the insurance um, is a fallback option, and that's what Peter alluded when he was planning at the beginning. What does the insurance or credit insurance do? It provides protection. You know, factoring is, is, is a purchase of a receivable. That means performance risk is zero. The service or the goods have already been delivered. So you just are waiting to collect payment. And the payment is supposed to come from the buyer. The seller is the one that will hold, hold the receivable uh, and the buyer is the one that will pay. So the buyer may default, something may happen to the buyer, maybe bankruptcy or whatever. That's where credit insurance can come in to take the risk of the buyer. And for the buyer's risk to be taken by the insurance company before issuing the credit insurance uh, cover, they need to do the credit analysis to, to, be, to get comfortable with the buyer. Uh, and for them to do that credit analysis, they need, they need to know the payment track record of that buyer. Have they been defaulting in the past? Do, is there any data? Do they have any credit track record? Once that is done, then it will provide comfort 
to the insurance company to issue the credit insurance cover. So insurance indeed uh, in many parts of uh, the world, like in, in Europe where factoring thrives, uh, is very, very uh, helpful. But the challenge we have in Africa is that because we don't have a database with a credit track record or a consolidated database, or even in a country like Nigeria, we have um, the credit bureaus and some of the uh, MSMEs uh, uh, who are the buyer uh, of a factoring or uh, who are the buyer in a factoring transaction, do not have that track record. That is why insurance, credit insurance is not readily available, but it's something that we are pushing for as well with all our partners for that to, to, to be available, to uh, speak to the comfort that a factor will want to take so that if the buyer cannot pay, then the factor has a fallback option to be uh, able to have uh, the risk level. And this is very, very, very critical for factoring to thrive. Thank you. All right. Thank you very much, oh. Eric, for that explanation. Um, I have um, two questions more. And this question we go to uh, Mr. Hassan. I hope Mr. Hassan is still with us. I'm still here, madam. Okay, all right, thank you very much. So um, this question is um, around the role of the banks or the bank regulator in factoring. I know um, we've mentioned whether, you know, um, it's different from commercial lending, you know, factoring, it's, you know, totally different, or maybe they are similar in some terms. So the question is, are banks also factoring companies or are they different or is there any conflict of interest? Uh, thank you very much. Uh, that's a great question indeed. Um, you know, the Central Bank of Nigeria is rather unique, even among central banks, because of its involvement in developmental interventions. So the CBN is not just focused on monetary policy as traditionally done by other central banks, but has a wonderful, a great focus and strategy on assisting the development of the country. And that's why you see a lot of interventions and also the realization that the MSMEs are the backbone of any sustainable economy. So you see in CBN, we have the uh, ACMEs, we have the Agricultural Credit Guarantee Scheme, so many interventions. The last time I counted, we had about 29 different interventions. Now, as a regulator, we do a lot of things. For example, the loan to credit ratio regime we highlighted recently, where banks are compelled as part of regulation to ensure a certain percentage of their, uh, I mean, deposits are, to, are geared towards uh, credit provision for MSMEs. Uh, the, the Central Bank of Nigeria was equally instrumental in the establishment of the National Microfinance Bank, as you are aware, which basically focuses on MSME development and advancing credit to them. So apart from what we are doing directly, the Central Bank of Nigeria has a lot of regulatory frameworks that will assist advancing, enhancing credit to MSMEs for their development. And let me also use this opportunity to call upon the MSMEs and the MSMC, MSME Association to actually leverage, take full advantage of these interventions that they might not even be aware of. We're trying a lot to talk about it, but sadly, the message doesn't seem to be going through. We have the Small Scale Industries Credit Guarantee Scheme. We have the Small and Medium Enterprise Credit Guarantee Scheme. We have the Anko Boros Program. We have the Party Aggregation Scheme, CBN Creative Industry Fund, Private Accelerator and Cultural Development Scheme, Non-Oil Export Stimulation Facility, Export Development Facility, oh. Bank of Industry Intervention Funds, a lot of them targeted credit facility to address the issue of COVID to MSMEs and families, the MSME Development Fund, the Commercial and Cultural Credit Scheme, Mandatory Credit Guidelines, in result of MSMEs, as I mentioned, the loan to deposit a regime we instituted and which we are ensuring are complied with by commercial banks. So a lot of things, but again, it is about awareness, knowledge, and the realization that there are a lot of things going on. Sadly, our MSMEs are not. So we could easily move in to factory. And like I mentioned, direct instruction for the governor of the Central Bank of Nigeria 
that we must come up with guidelines on factory to provide yeah. that confidence and comfort in the Nigerian financial system as a stopgap to an establishment law that will actually, by law as an act of parliament, take care of all the issues around factory. I hope that answers uh, the Yes, definitely does. Thank you very much. Um, there's one question that just um, came up now, and that's um, what are the key considerations for setting up factoring business in Nigeria? Um, I will leave that for Henry to answer. What are the key considerations? Sorry, I missed that. Was that addressed to me? Sorry? Okay. And the question is for um, Henry, which is what are the key considerations oh. for setting up factoring business in Nigeria? Okay, um, I'm not sure he's still here with us. Um, who we want to answer that question? Maybe Keep Larry on. and Peter Muroy can assist, Madam Chair. All right, thank you, Eric. Okay, uh, thank you for that question. The, Go ahead, Mr. The, factory the, the, the Central Bank of Nigeria. Um, uh, me factoring regulation we come under their supervisions. So is the is the is the Central Bank of Nigeria is under finance no, regulation. Please, let's please, 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 Consideration is basically um, uh, the, the requirement is under the the finance company's uh, regulations supervised by Central Bank. Uh, so to set that up, you need to go through the Central Bank of Nigeria and apply for license. So they have that um, um, authority to license a factory firm in Nigeria under the General Finance House guideline. Thank you. All right, thank you very much. And the last question is about innovation in factoring. I mean, this is the technology age and there's no doubt that um, technology will have a critical role to play in factoring. So this last question is for Peter. So um, what technology innovation you know, is driving factoring or would drive factoring in the future? Okay, maybe I can ask, uh, say what is not driving the future of factoring from a technological perspective, because there's so many developments. Um, in fact, I was just, um, we're preparing for, we're having our annual meeting in, uh, in three weeks in Washington, D.C., uh, okay. where we're inviting the industry. And I know <clears throat> the Afro Exxon Bank is organizing a, 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 an Africa event at the annual meeting. We're so excited about it. Um, on Monday, the 20th of, of, uh, of, of, of uh, June, if anybody's interested in attending. But OK, um, we are going to have a discussion on this very, very important topic. And I would say there's three or four major influences. The first influence is uh, this just general digitization, the effect of digitization. Because in our world, um, we deal with invoices. Okay, in some cases, we also deal with shipping documents. Sometimes we do need the bill of lading sometimes, but we're not, we, we don't do LCs. We're not requiring all the types of different documentation, which uh, I know the ICC and other organizations are very, um, 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 you know, are, are focusing on this, especially in this COVID uh, pandemic era uh, where there were so many delays and problems because they couldn't get documentation, you know, so, but for our, for us, it's mostly invoices. And, you know, you could say in a way that we've been, I, even in my evolution in the last 20 years, I've seen huge increase in the percentage of invoices done electronically within the system. However, there's a thing called e-invoicing, and this is due to e-commerce. And these e-invoicing, uh, e-invoicing is becoming a very, very popular uh, form of, uh, of, of, of paper, of non-paper, digital, digital invoice around the world. Now, why? Because um, 
if you create an e-invoice and you have a register within the within your country to monitor these invoices, well, any type of dark trade, trade that's in the in the black economy will be elevated in, into light, meaning you now have um, uh, for, for tax purposes and, and other purposes, a legitimacy of the trade transaction. <clears throat> and, uh, and so um, a lot of governments are really pushing this evolution of e-invoicing. Uh, and, and you have countries now, and, and for example, in Latin America, which is taking the lead, places like in Chile, in Peru, almost 100% of their economy is now digital, uh, electronic invoicing. I mean, all, almost all of it. So um, you, you and, and, and that makes it a much easier to factor. If you could just transfer an, an invoice electronically to the factor, you know, it's instantaneous cash yes. for, the, for the company. I would say that. The other two is blockchain. Blockchain mm -hmm. is having also a real effect by allowing for greater transparency in the transaction because you have this issue of fraud. Uh, that's real, very real in our, in our industry. But if you can eliminate fraud by having both the seller and the buyer and the factor all looking in one system, in one platform and legitimizing the transaction, uh, it eliminates fraud. So I know that um, blockchain really has a huge future in our industry, uh, but it's going to take time. Uh, really, there's very, very few examples of it in, pl in place now. Um, there are other like new things, like for example, I just wrote an article about the evolution of receivables exchanges. So, with the capability of all this digital digital documentation and uh, e invoicing, I think the time is ripe for a, the creation of a global receivables exchange. You have exchanges mm -hmm. all over the world in every type of asset class: hard metals, com soft commodities, uh, currencies, of course, stocks, etc. Why not receivables? It's an asset class. So this, so I think this is coming and we're going to have a very big discussion, a debate on this during the annual meeting in Washington, D.C. I could go on and on, but those are just some of the things that I see, you know, in, in terms of uh, the uh, impact of, uh, of technology in our industry. All right. Thank you very much, Peter. Um, the receivables exchange is really exciting. And I think that's um, where the capital markets will come into. I mean, it's an asset like commodities and currencies. So why not? We'll, we'll look out for that in the future. Yeah. All right. Thank you very much, panelists. Well, we can go on and on and on, but <laughs> definitely we, we have to end this session. But um, we'll end this session with a feedback poll. So we'll call our um, technology team to put up the poll for us. We want feedback on how this... Um, session has been. So the first poll actually is not about the feedback. Um, it's about um, what you consider to be the most important in the advancement of factoring as a service. So we have four options. So please, let's um, take the poll. Let me Okay, host and panelists cannot vote. Sorry, <laughs> panelists will not be able to vote. <laughs> I read the no. that. <laughs> Why now? <laughs> okay, um, the votes are coming in already. We will be able to see the results. I can see the results here. Okay, technology, I'm sure once we are done, you show us the results. Please keep your vote coming in. So the first is demand for factoring finance by the market. Is that the most important in advancing factoring as a service? Second is difficulty in obtaining or retrieving existing data, including credit bureaus. And the third is the licensing regime, as well as defining the capital requirements and pricing levels. And the last is lack of credible data at the business level. I'm sure we should have ended the poll by now. Technology, please, can we have the results? 
Wow, interesting. Demand for factoring finance by the markets is the highest at 34%, followed by difficulty in obtaining or retrieving existing data. And the third is lack of credible data at business level. And the last is the licensing regime. I guess the licensing regime is taken as given, you know, while the others, you know, revolve around the application of the regulation. So that's the result of the poll. So we'll go into the second poll, um, which is the feedback on this session. So we'd like to know how this session has um, been for you. Technology, we're waiting for you. The feedback poll. Okay. Hey, Buka, are we still expecting the poll? No, at this point, it doesn't seem like we'll be having the second poll, so I think we can go ahead. Okay, we'll have love to know, you know, we have feedback on the, on the session, whether it was insightful, exciting, you know, um, but well, we are very sure that it's, um, the positive one and we have all enjoyed the session. So we have come to an end of um, the round table and it's been a very, very um, interesting one, um, exchanging ideas, you know, um, having conversation on this very important topic. I'll call on Ebuka to wrap up and close the session. Thank you very much once again, panelists and attendees. Thank you. Thank you, Shay. Thank you. Thank you very much, Shay. And good day, everyone. We hereby express our gratitude to and thanks to the moderator, our distinguished speakers and panelists who have shed significant light on the importance of factoring to SME and the critical success factors to the growth of the industry. We have taken key learnings from this session, including the huge financing gap for MSMEs with only 0.3% of credit facilities in Nigeria currently available to MSMEs. We have also understood the differences between invoice discounting and factoring, particularly non-recourse factoring. Um, we have taken considerable lessons on the importance of tax considerations and engagement with the tax authorities, particularly as we set the regulatory guidelines, which would um, take the industry to the next level that we desire to see. Um, another significant learning, um, which um, Peter pointed out recent, um, recently, was the, the evolution of the savings exchanges. And we have taken note of that, particularly the role of technology and the fact that Nigeria can certainly leapfrog the development of factoring, which has taken place in um, other developed countries. So we can leapfrog and continue to play at a significant level. So. Um, FITC thanks all the organizers. We thank um, the FSS 2020 led by Mr. Ibrahim Azan. Thank you very much, sir, for your opening address. We thank Peter Muroy. Thank you very much. FCI. Um, we, we have always um, called on you and you have always given us a listening ear at any time. Um, we thank the Nigeria Factoring Working Group, Afrexim, Megzim. Unfortunately, Hope couldn't join us, but we know that he, he must have um, been with us in spirit. We thank uh, Mr. Nasiru um, Aminu, Mr. Akinwande Pes from GIZ, and the technology and brand and experience team of FITC, who have all supported the success of this event. Finally, we would like to inform you of FITC advisory services for SME, SMEs. So we offer various services in strategy, financial advisory, human capital advisory, and other operational capabilities. So thank you once more to all our esteemed attendees. We appreciate the time you have spent with us and we hope you have been able to make the most of this event. 
We look forward to having you at subsequent events um, organized by FITC, which are available on our website. Thank you and welcome. Have a beautiful day, everyone. Thank you, everyone. Bye bye. Thank you. Take care. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Thank bye. You. bye. Wow, <laughs> what an interesting session.